Jesus saves, church. Amen, amen. God is good. And all the time. And if you're visiting with us here today, know that at Cala Mesa, we don't say that in a trite way, just to say that God is good. We believe and know that God is good. That uh, even though life can be challenging and difficult and seem out of control, God is good all the time. And you know, I'm just so blessed by the music today, and, uh, and I know the message that's coming, so I'm already blessed. But, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I feel grace drawing me to surrender is because we can have as much Jesus as we want. And the good news is that Jesus gave all of himself. And so I feel the Holy Spirit drawing me to say, so surrender it all because you want all of Jesus, John. Less of me, more of him. And life is really good that way, really good. I want to um, say a special thanks to our guest today, Christian Edition. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, Calvin Nipp's child, thank you so much for your directorship. Appreciate it. Looking forward to this afternoon. And then uh, Shannon, I got that right. Not Sharon, but Shannon <laughs> and Kelly, thank you so much for, I want to say welcome home. Look, good having you back every year. So wonderful blessing. Thank you. And I forgot to thank our own home here as well, Doris and Steve and Claudette. Thank you for your music and blessing us here. We're blessed with the talent. And uh, can't forget Mike Philman. Mike, I think, is already sitting down, but Mike, I mean, just all the Bob works him to the bones on his fingers all August, right? He just, uh, thank you so much. And I hope I'm not missing anybody. Am I missing anybody? Carol. Oh, I, I didn't have Carol. We saved the best for last, right? Carol, thank you so much, Carol. Carol and I go back to 1991 is when we first met, right? I'd only been pastor for three years. Went to this great little church in Encinitas, California. And, uh, but blessed, and her husband, Don, at the back. Thank you, Don, for letting her come and play with us today and so forth. Blessed, thank you so much. Um, some nuts and bolts. We need some corn and watermelon, all right? The Holy Spirit's calling to us this morning. He's saying, bring watermelon next week and bring corn. Bring the corn hot and the watermelon cold. Okay, I said this last week, I'll say it again. Do not bring warm watermelon, okay? We want cold watermelon, hot corn. Bring it at 6.30, if you will. We have a Vesper starting at 6.30. It'll go till 7 o'clock, and then we'll start eating our feast. And we've got some great uh, things planned for the evening as usual, which is our, our tradition. I want to also just mention something very special today. We have some flowers up here in celebration of 66 years of marriage for Bob and Thelma Knutson. And I think Bob might be with us today. Is Bob with us today? Bob? Happy anniversary. And uh, we're sorry that Thelma is not doing well at this time, but I think you know your church family loves and adores you both greatly. And uh, we're just blessed by your, your life and your love for Jesus and Thelma's and all those notes and cards and calls that have gone out over the years. So please give her a big hug for us, okay? All right, great. We celebrate you. It's wonderful. And uh, I think last, I've written myself some things here so I don't forget. And um, is this for me or is that for you? Okay. <laughs> Make sure I cover everything. Um, finally, or next to... Next to finally, I want to remind you about our prayer room, which is in that door to my right, to your left. If any of you would like prayer following the service, please come back for prayer. Pastoral staff and prayer team is there to pray with you. If you'd like to just make a prayer request, we have a prayer wall. You can put your prayer request on, and the pastors and prayer team will be praying for you. So I just want to invite you to that. Finally, we have a special treat today with our guest speaker, Dr. William Johnson, or as he says, you can call me Bill. <laughs> And uh, we are blessed to also have his wife, Nolene, with us today and to share this experience with us. Uh, Dr. Johnson, I just can't call him Bill. He's just, he's still Dr. Johnson to me. Um, but uh, he became editor-in-chief of our review back in, I think it was 1982, we established. And uh, I just want to share this because he was uh, about 25 years as editor, roughly, about 25 years as editor. I graduated high school in 1983. And I share that because I would see this Adventist review show up at the home. You know, my parents had it come into the house and so forth. And I, you know, as a teenager, I wasn't really looking at that. But every once in a while, I'd look at it. And I noticed this guy who was always in it all the time. 
<laughs> and uh, I would read some of the things that he would write. And, and I got to tell you, I fully know and believe that it was through the writing of uh, Dr. Johnson that Jesus continued to draw me to himself through the presence of the Holy Spirit. His gracious articles, his gentleness I sense coming through his writing and the love of Jesus. So thank you for your faithfulness for the many, many years of speaking and writing for the kingdom of God here on earth. We are, we are truly blessed. Um, I want to just share something. If you have not read his book, make sure I got the right phone. If you have not read his book, um, Where Are We Headed? Adventism After San Antonio. I really want to encourage you to get that book and read it. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, it's easy to find. Also, following Potluck today, he's going to be doing some Q&A on his book that's coming out pretty soon. But I just want to share with you uh, a quote that I enjoyed from this book. He said, historically for Seventh-day Adventists, unity flows from the bottom up. The center of our church is not in Silver Spring, Maryland, but in each local congregation around the world. Our unity comes not from policies made by humans, but from the Holy Spirit. In them, and, and you and me, I in them, and you in me, that they may be perf made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved me as you have loved me, Jesus said. John 17. And then he quotes Paul in Ephesians 4. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And then he goes on to write, and he says, Here in the local congregation, where we gather to sing, Pray, worship, study the word, and go forth energized to tell others about Jesus. Here is where unity happens. This unity flows out to the local conference, the union conference, and to the general conference. It's as we worship together in the Holy Spirit and we grow in the Holy Spirit that unity happens and overflows. And I thank you so much for your very real and relevant word uh, that you have, that you're bringing to us, and that you've written about. And again, I encourage you to, to read this book because I appreciate how you answer some of the things that Adventism is really wrestling with in a very real, in a very honest, and I think a very healthy way. So let's welcome Dr. Johnson today to share with us today the message of Jesus. Shall we? Good morning. Good morning. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It is great to be with you. I love this church. First time we've been here and I love it. God is doing something good here. I know some of you very well, Dr. Bob, your pastor, Pastor John, Others who come to this church, like uh, Dean, John Pauline, from the School of Religion. A lot of good people come here. I understand why. It's a fine church. Thank you for inviting me today to come and talk about Jesus. You know, I'm getting, as they say, a, a little bit long in the tooth. <laughs> but uh, Thursday morning, I woke up and it was just like God said to me, what a privilege you have to be invited to speak about Jesus. It is. There's a blessing always when we talk about Jesus. You know, sometimes we, we make a big deal about praying for the Holy Spirit. Well, you know what? Talk about Jesus and the Spirit of God is there. Because the work of the Spirit is to exalt Jesus. When Jesus is exalted, the Holy Spirit is there. No magic formulas. It just happens like that. It was at a camp meeting a few years back as a teenager that I publicly stood to accept Jesus. At a camp meeting. And so... I'm glad we still have camp meetings. That one, which was down in southern Australia, quite a bit different here from here. But it was the same Lord and the same Spirit. And so, to me, camp meeting is very, very important. A time when we focus 
on what is most important in life, where we are going, where we're headed, focus on Jesus, and open ourselves to his leading. Today, my friends, the message is very simple. It's all about Jesus. That's the title. And I'm sharing with you three stories from the Gospels, all from the Gospel of Luke, as it turns out, all involve women. Not, that wasn't intentional, but they do. All from the Gospel of Luke. Now, I have to tell you, I could choose many, many other stories from the Gospel because the Gospels are all about Jesus. Let me tell you about this Jesus, my friend. He's strong. He's brave. He is true. That is my Jesus. Strong and brave and true. He's terrific. He's dynamic. And he is radical. There are two Jesus out there. The first Jesus, very common, is what I would call <clears throat> the virtual Jesus. The virtual Jesus. It's the usual Jesus, the church Jesus. The general Jesus, meek and mild. He doesn't rock the boat. He makes you feel comfortable with this Jesus. You can go to church and still have hate in your heart. You can hate someone whose skin is a different color. You can hate someone who is gay or lesbian. You can hate someone who comes from a different country or practices a different religion. Yes, you can. You can sing songs to this Jesus Songs is Jesus, who makes you feel comfortable in your hate. The problem, my friends, is this is not the real Jesus. It is the virtual Jesus. The Jesus that people have made in their minds. Listen, they would never have crucified that Jesus. Never forget it. Jesus of Nazareth was executed. The cross was not a pretty thing. He was executed. But that Jesus, the virtual Jesus, is colorless. He's gray. He's bland. The real Jesus gets angry. He gets angry when religious leaders rip off poor people. This Jesus has eyes that blaze and hands that whip the animals in the temple courts <clears throat> and drives them out. This Jesus overturns the tables of the money changers, sending the coins flying. This Jesus overturns the status quo. This Jesus upends everything. This Jesus, if you let him, will overturn your life. This Jesus overturned my life. This Jesus was a threat, a toothhold threat, to the Romans, first of all, because he was Messiah. And for them, there was one king only, the emperor in Rome. He was a threat. And he was a threat to the religious establishment because they made a lot of money out of their religion. And this man did not go along with them. It's no wonder that they crucified the real Jesus, my friends. The only wonder is that they, it took so long before at last they put him to death. So today I'm going to talk about this Jesus Three stories from the Gospel of Luke. The first one comes from Luke 13. I call it Sabbath Games. I'll read it quickly. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues 
A woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over, could not straighten up. Ever seen anyone like this, crippled over, you know, curvature of the spine, you know, eyes can only look down, never look up to see the sunshine, never to see the stars. We don't see many people like that here in the United States. But overseas you do. We lived in India 15 years. And we saw plenty of cases like that. Like this poor, poor woman, woman. So she comes to church. It's Sabbath. And Jesus sees her. He called her out and said to her, Woman, you're set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Now, that's not the end of the story. Someone is not happy. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days to work. Come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? Don't come on the Sabbath to be healed. Come tomorrow. Incredible. What does Jesus say? You hypocrite. You hypocrite. And that word hypocrite simply means actor. Same word in the original. You're an actor. You're playing at religion. You look like your religious leader, but you're acting at religion. Your religion is phony. It's not real. You hypocrite. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Of course you do. Then shouldn't this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath from what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. Oh, I love this story. One of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. There are four players in this story. Number one, the people who've come for worship. And then there's the ruler of the synagogue. If you like, <clears throat> he's the Sabbath police. His job is to see that everybody keeps the Sabbath to the letter. And there's a woman who has this curvature of the spine, poor lady, for 18 years she's been like it. Finally, there's Jesus, it's Sabbath, and he comes to worship that day. Then service is moving along until Jesus messes everything up. As I think of, of these four players, the people, the ruler, the woman, Jesus. For three of them, it's me. The only one that's not me is Jesus. The other three, it's me. The people. Like them, you know, I come to church, I see her, and I look the other way because I've come to worship. Get the thought? Okay. Then there's the woman. I'm the woman. Bent over and crippled by sin. Jesus calls me forward, puts his hand on me, and says, go free, go free. I am the woman. And my friends, Yes, I am the synagogue ruler. I am. Can you believe it? My first job in the Adventist ministry was academy dean of boys. Talk about the Sabbath police. Okay. <laughs> Noeline and I married straight out of college like a month. Three weeks later, we were on a boat to India where we worked for 15 years before we came back. Okay. 
Our first assignment there was in Vincent Hill School, little school up in the mountains. I see someone nodding. Wonderful school, six, seven thousand feet up on the first ridge of the mighty mountains, the Himalayas after the monsoon when the air had been washed clean by the rain, you could look out over the plains and see forever. They said a hundred miles, you could see forever. Incredible school. But it was a small school, isolated. In those days, later it changed, in those days the only way to get to that school was to walk in. Or you could be carried could ride a donkey in, or you could be carried in a basket on the back of a coolie. The only way in that school, later they built a road and motor vehicles come in. So in that school, what do you do? A boarding school, at a school, where you're isolated, what do you do? What do the faculty do? Well, they spent a lot of time talking among themselves, and especially about the students. <laughs> Sound familiar? Okay. Those were the days of what they used to call peg pants. These were tight-fitting pants for boys. Peg pants. The faculty, after many hours of deliberation, tut-tutting at peg pants, passed the rule. All pants on Sabbath must have cuffs, 16 inches wide. <laughs> what a joke, because we had boys six feet two, we had boys eight year old, way, way shorter. One rule for everybody, 16 inch cuffs. <coughs> this is Sabbath baloney, friends. It is absolute <laughs> baloney, okay. So I'm the dean of boys. It is my unhappy lot to go in the dorm, room by room, measuring the cuffs of the boys' pants. I'm not making this up. Sabbath baloney. Yes, I've been there. Baloney, my friends, is pretentious nonsense. Pretentious because it is all done for show. Nonsense because it doesn't impress God one bit. Does any of this strike any faint echo in your experience? <laughs> maybe, maybe. I've been in church work <clears throat> for more than 50 years. I can tell you, I've seen a lot of Adventist baloney. But it's not only Adventists. All religions suffer from it looking right, saying the right things, ultra-careful about what others will think of you. The Sabbath was made for us, said Jesus. We've turned it too often, 180 degrees around. The longest Sabbath of my life, oh, I remember it so well, was a Sabbath in Tennessee. Where we lived, I'd studied at Vanderbilt. And uh, we were out with Pathfinders, and it was hot and humid, as only Tennessee can be in the middle of summer. And we were camped. You know what's coming. Where were we camped? On the edge of a lake. That water was so inviting, so cool. And we are hot and humid, and counting the hours, the minutes, the seconds till the sun would go down. <laughs> yes, I've been there, the synagogue ruler. Jesus cuts through all the baloney. He shows us what true religion is really like. He does not play Sabbath games. That's story number one. I've got to keep moving because you're getting hungry probably. Number two. Luke 8, 1 to 3, I like to call this one the forgotten women of Galilee. Just three verses that I had read many, many times, maybe a hundred times, until one day, wow, 
What is this saying? Listen, listen. What is it saying? After this, Jesus traveled about from town to town, village to village, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. The twelve were with him, and also, and also some, who? Women, who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Then three are named, Mary, Mary the Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, wife of Cusa, manager of Herod, that's King Herod, manager of King Herod's household. So he's a big shot, Cusa is. And where's his wife? Traveling around with Jesus, okay? And then Susanna, and says Luke, many others. How many is many? Two, three, no. Many is more than that. Well, I don't know how many. But there were a good number of women there. So these women went along, and they cooked the meals, did the washing, right? Wrong. What does it say? These women were helping to support them out of their own means. These women are wealthy women, and they are helping to pay the bills for Jesus' ministry. Is that a new thought to you? I'm not making it up. It's been there all along and took me forever. Until one day I said, wow, what is it saying? So, you know, what does it tell us? Well, obviously, Jesus had women disciples. You can't deny that. Okay. Uh, several of them are actually named. Um, and there were many others. They were wealthy women. They bankrolled the mission. Wait a minute. Was this something common among the Jews for rabbis to have women traveling around with them? Was it common? No way. No way. This is something way off the chart. I wondered a lot about this. What did the husbands of these women think? Okay, Joanna, as a husband, he works in the king's court. His name is Cusa, and she's out with Jesus. What did he think about it? I don't know. I would like to know. So intriguing story. How did the women become wealthy? They must have been independently wealthy to be able to finance Jesus' operations. Three little verses, but they raise so many questions. They tell us a lot about Jesus. Now let me rush, hasten to add. No hint of anything sort of borderline here in Jesus' conduct. No, there's no hint. If there had been, you can be sure the enemies of Jesus would have been right onto it, accusing him of immorality. There's no hint of that. Wandering rabbis of Jesus' day uh, were afforded hospitality in the towns and villages. People opened their doors, and they had a place to sleep, and uh, they were given food. And so this was a common practice in all respects, except that there were women in Jesus' entourage. So interesting. Among the Jews at that time, uh, women were considered in a very, um, what shall I say, ambivalent fashion, to say the best, as the kindest. Um, women had second-class status. They weren't allowed to testify in court. If you're a woman, you can't testify, okay? They couldn't go out alone in public or talk to strangers outside the home, they had to be veiled, two veils. Now in Roman society of the time, it was different. Women could have independent wealth, and many did. And obviously that was the case with Joanna. Remember, she's a Roman, she's not Jewish. Okay? But among the Jews, this is extraordinary conduct. The daily prayer of the Jews was, how would you like this prayer, ladies? 
Praise be to God. He has not created me a Gentile. Praise be to God that he has not created me a woman. How about that? Nice prayer for Jim. What do you say? For we men to pray, yeah. <laughs> Thank God I, he didn't make me a woman. Thank God he didn't create me an ignorant man. Among the Pharisees who were the strict sect of the Jews of the time, there was a particular group called the Black and Blue Pharisees. These were interesting characters, very, very strict, okay? And for them, the biggest temptation, guess what? A woman, okay? okay. So they avoided looking on the face of a woman at any cost. So going down the street, a woman's coming. What do you do? Head down and walk straight ahead, don't look even if it means you run into a wall or trip over and, and, and get all scratched up. They're black and blue because that's the way they behave in the presence of women. And here is Jesus of Nazareth. He has women disciples. They even went around with him. This is amazing. This is shocking. In recent years, Adventists have spent a lot of time debating whether women pastors should, might be ordained. Often it's said, Jesus didn't ordain any women, and that is absolutely correct. But I have to quickly add, nor did he ordain any men. Jesus didn't ordain anyone, okay? He simply selected people to be his disciples. And he selected men and he selected women because we have their names right here. This is Jesus. I said at the beginning, he's shocking, he's radical. Beginning to agree, he's radical. <clears throat> when Jesus rose again from the dead, that Sunday morning, the first people who saw him who went to the tomb were women. Where are Peter, James, John? Hey, they all ran away. They were chicken. They were scared. Those same women that we meet in Luke chapter 8, the forgotten women of Galilee, they went from Galilee with Jesus to Jerusalem on his final journey that led him to the cross. And on Sunday morning, they came to the tomb. And to them, the word came, go and tell the men. Go and tell Peter and the other disciples that he's risen. Go and tell them. So they were the first evangelists, if you like. They were women. So my friends, that's story number two. Okay? What about this Jesus? Are you beginning to sort of like him? How could you not like this guy? Incredible. The third story is a very familiar one. It comes from Luke 21, 1 to 4. I like to call this follow the money. <laughs> the phrase comes from the Nixon era and Watergate. So Jesus is in counting down to the last days of his life. He's in Jerusalem in the temple courts <clears throat> and uh, he's standing by the treasury he sees the rich people putting their gifts into the offering. And he sees a poor widow put in two very small coins. And then he says, I tell you, this poor widow put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty and her extreme poverty put in all she had to live on. Usually when we tell this story, we emphasize how small her gift was. And it was small. In the Greek, it's two lepra, and a lepron, that's a singular form, was worth about one-eighth of one cent. Now that is getting really small money. She has two, the tiniest coins, tiny copper coins. How small an offering was 
And Jesus says, no. <laughs> How big her offering. Because when the fat cats came with all their hundred dollar bills and made a big show of putting in the big offering, when they went home, they still had plenty left. When this woman went home, what did she have left? Zero. Nada. Okay. It's all gone. This woman intrigues me. I love this story. Have you ever thought about that offering and whether she was reckless? This woman was reckless, just like God. She has two, two little coins. What is the prudent thing to do? What's the prudent thing to do? You give one, and you have one left. If you give both, you have nothing, nothing. But she doesn't give one, she gives both. Just like God. He's a reckless giver. Friends, what do you do with your money? What do I do with my money? Follow the money. The money tells a lot about you. Anywhere, follow the money. You'll see the values of an organization or a society or a church. Follow the money. Last month, um, Nolan and I did something we'd been thinking about for a long while. We went on a riverboat cruise to Europe. Ever been on one? I recommend it. We're going back first opportunity. We've done this ocean cruising. Listen, cruising the rivers of Europe is incredibly wonderful. We cruised on the Blue Danube, which, by the way, is green and not blue. <laughs> and we cruised from Budapest in Hungary, east, 11 days, until we came to Romania, uh, where we left and went overland to the capital city, which is Bucharest. Romania, I'd been there a couple of times before. It's a beautiful country. It's amazing. It's a long way east. It borders the Black Sea for good night. But you know, that city so far from Italy, the people speak a language. You know, that if you know Portuguese, as these women do here, and Italian, you can understand Romanian. It's a very ancient, it's Romania, remember? Romania, or Romania. Anyway, this town, the city of Bucharest, is worth going to see, whether you go by boat or whatever. It is modeled in many ways after the city of Paris. It's called the Paris of the East. It is, it is a lovely city in so many ways. And it boasts an unusual building. In this city, you'll find the second largest building in the whole world. What is the largest building? Okay. Anyone guess? The largest building is in America, and it's the Pentagon. That's the biggest building in the world. For number two, you have to go to Bucharest. You see this building, it's nearly a mile around. It has 1,050 rooms. It costs more than three billion, that's B, B, billion dollars when it was built 20 years ago. What is this building? Well, the story of it's interesting. Remember, follow the money. It was built by the last communist dictator of Romania. His name was Nikolai, Tri tricky word, Tri Ceausescu, okay? He was a megalomaniac. He robbed, he raped the country and poured money into this huge building. When you try to take a, get a photograph of it, it's difficult because it's so big. You have to get way back. Follow the money. Here's the irony, my friends. He never got to live in that building. 1988, 1989, in December, 
There was an uprising. He and his wife were tried on Christmas Day, 1989, and shot. That was the end of this communist dictator who built this second largest building in the world. Follow the money. Follow the money. What does the money, my money, say about me? What is the way we in the Adventist church, the way we handle money, what does that say about our values? You know, I lived, worked at the General Conference for a quarter of a century, and I, I can say this quite openly, I think our treasurers are honest people. Okay? They work hard, they handle the money carefully. Now I think at times the way the church spends money, that's another story, <laughs> but uh, you know, um, the treasurers are certainly honest. Um, so over the years, this, this item has meant a lot to me. You see, I sometimes in our church, I'm being very open with you now, okay? You didn't hear this the first service, okay? <laughs> you know, sometimes in a, our church, we make a big deal about people who give a million dollars, or, and we do have big givers, and praise God for them. They're generous, you know. Some give more than a million dollars okay, a year, much more. Okay. But this church, my friends, now what I'm getting at is, too often, I was at a general conversation. A big offering is being raised. A guy gives a million dollars. What happens Sabbath morning? He's up on the platform okay, to do something or other. He wasn't a preacher. He was a fat cat. And he's put up there. This is not the way Jesus worked, my friends, okay? What did he say? Who had given more than the big givers? That widow who gave two small coins. My, uh, I didn't grow up Adventist. I did not. Um, I hardly knew, frankly, friends, what the inside of a church looked like until I was a teenager. Now, I won't go into the story of our family, which is interesting. I'm the youngest of nine. My dad became an Adventist after they'd been married, had a couple of kids. My mother, an Anglican, brought up a strict Anglican, never went along with him. And there's a story behind that also. And so I grew up in the, I grew up not an Adventist, and became an Adventist, I told you, at a camp meeting. My dad used to go to church, he told me to camp meeting. Call was made, I stood up and went forward. That began a journey for me, which has been an incredible journey, believe me, an incredible journey. This church, which is flawed, is also wonderful. It has many good things in it. It has largely made me what I am, and I thank God for it. And so, I am not a critic of this church. I wish some things would change. Some of the things I write may have caused some heartburn in Washington, but they are a lover's quarrel with this church. They are not a critic's poison pen directed at the church. So I look at what's going on around us, dear friends, and you know, at times, and we hardly know what's worse, you know, the devil or the deep blue sea. <laughs> you look out in society, it looks like society is just going crazy around us. You ever get feel like that? At times we have to say, Nolan and I, we're not even going to look at the news for a week so we can get our sanity back. Am I the only one who feels like this? Okay. 
What a time like this, I want to tell you. We have Jesus. It's all about Jesus, not about what's happening in politics, Washington. It's important. Okay. At times, stuff happens in the church I'm not happy with and you're not happy with. But it's not about the church. It's really about Jesus. Okay. But I'm a member of this church. I'm no longer drawing salary, but I'm a member. And so long as the Lord gives me marble still and the conviction, I will speak out. That's why, why I write. Some of the folks said, why in retirement would you risk losing friends? And I've lost some friends, okay? It's because it's my church and I want to try to help it be better. But the good news is not me or the church. What is the good news? Jesus. Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So, dear friends, when you feel a bit down with the news, turn it off for a while, okay? Read the Bible, okay? When you feel down about the church, read your Bible, read the Gospels, read the stories of Jesus, and you'll find life again. To me, this thing called Christianity is sort of summed up in a word that the Apostle Paul uses quite a lot, overflowing. Christianity is like a fountain, starting with God, who has overflowing love that flows out to the universe and that flowed down to us, to me, overflowing. And then that overflowing love flows out from me, that's his plan, to other people, to bless them. It's, that's it. That's why I'm a follower of Jesus. I love him. He's strong and brave and true. And it's all about him. We knew he was dead It is finished, he said And we watched as his life ebbed away his body and sealed up the grave so I know how you feel his death was so real but please listen and hear what I say I've just seen Jesus
his voice she first heard those kind gentle words asking what was her reason for fear and I sobbed in despair my Lord is not Dear God, what a great time we've had here today. Wonderful music. We just heard this beautiful duet and the Christian edition, other musicians. It's been such a warm, beautiful service. And you've been here, Lord. We haven't seen you, but we know you've been here. We've felt you. You've been here through the Holy Spirit. We just want to say thank you. Thank you, Father. And above all, thank you for sending Jesus to be our friend, our Savior, and our Lord. Amen. <laughs>